Hello and welcome to part three of installing Arch Linux on a virtual machine on a Mac. Sorry it's been so long since the last videos, things started to happen, real life and all that, and it's just meant I've been really, really busy. But now I intend to carry on with the series so that you can get your Arch Linux installed and have a go at building your own desktop so you can get an idea of how all the layers of Linux fit together. So first of all, let's recap what we did last time. We used the lsblk command for list block devices and we created three partitions on the SDA drive, one, two, and three. We created SDA one as a 500 meg partition. This is going to be our boot partition. Then we created SDA two, which is going to be our swap partition. And then we created SDA three, which is going to be our root file system. Now, the first thing we need to do is we need to mount them to the system. For those of you that aren't familiar with the idea of mounting a disk file system, it comes from the idea that in open systems like uh, Unix and servers and things that have to stay online, sometimes you have to add and remove disk drives from them and you don't want to take them offline in order to do that. So the idea is that with a live Linux system, you can actually mount or connect, if you like, or unmount, disconnect, a disk drive while it's running, no problem. So for example, we're going to do just that here. We're going to add the drives to the system so they become live and so you can talk to them and then we're going to remove them afterwards. And this is obviously handy uh, if you've got a, you need to upgrade a drive for example, if you've got disk space problems, you're running out of disk space, no problem, assuming your hardware is a server and it's got what we call hot plugging enabled, you can just plug a hard drive into it, come over to the console here, mount the drive into the system and it just starts to work. No need to turn the system off, good times. So first thing we're going to do is type mount, then we're going to choose the device we want to mount. In this case, we're going to do SDA3 because that's our root file system. And we're going to mount it to a folder called mount. Mounts can only be mounted to folders. If the folder doesn't exist, you can't mount to it. So we're going to want to mount our boot partition underneath our root file system. So we're going to need to create that directory. So I'm going to do MKDIR, which is make directory. The minus P allows me to do more than one folder. If I just use make directory, I can make a single folder in this file. If I use minus P, it allows me to create it somewhere else further in. So in this case, mnt forward slash boot is what I want to create. And then I want to mount dev sda1 oops, to mount boot. Now we can check what we've just done. Now, if you can remember from last time, there are a couple of shortcuts you can use when you're on the command line. The up arrow lets you step back through the commands you've done. And then just press enter so we can check the uh, devices again. Now you'll notice under the mount point section, the SDA1 is mount boot and SDA3 is mount. Final thing we need to mount is the swap drive that we created, which is the one gig file on SDA2. And all you do for this is you use the command swap on, which means turn the swap on and then the device you want to turn the swap onto, in this case, SDA2. Up arrow, up arrow, enter, there we go. So as you can see now, all of our drives are mounted onto the system, which means we can now change directory into them and start writing to them and reading from them. So the next stage is we want to download the Arch Linux file system and install it on the root partition. Now in the Linux world, we use download mirrors. In the term mirror you'll hear a lot. The idea is, the original provider creates the repository, which is where we keep all the files and packages, and then people mirror that or take copies of it so they can provide it all over the world in different countries so you get a much quicker download and gives you the redundancy that if one goes down, it's all right, you can still download it from another. So the first thing we need to do is use VI, which is the built-in editor for text editing, go to etc. Then go to Pacman D. Pacman is the name of the package manager, which you're going to be using quite a bit on the next few videos. And then mirror list. Now you'll notice how you did a little clever thing there. I'll just show you again. You can use tab to do auto completion. So I typed MIR for mirror and I hit tab once and it auto completed it. You'll find you'll use tab to auto complete a lot when you're working on the command line. If it doesn't ever come up with a result when you single tab, double tab and it will give you an, a bunch of options that look similar to what you're typing. So we we'll press enter, and that's now opened this file into my text editor, as you can see here. Now, to give you some idea, if I didn't change this file, if I try to use Pacman, the installer, or Packstrap, which is the thing we're going to use to actually create our file system, it's going to use the first mirror it finds in this file. 
Now these files are generated regularly by Arch and they tend to do it based on algorithms which show which is the fastest mirror in whatever country. So it's, I believe, or at least it used to be, so I'm sorry if this isn't now current, but it used to be the fastest mirror at the top and, and, and likewise. So based on that assumption, I'm going to try and find a mirror in my country, which is the United Kingdom, which is going to be the fastest one, so the first one I'm going to find in the search. Something that a lot of people who aren't familiar with, with Linux get confused by is that case sensitivity matters in a lot of cases. A lot of commands are case sensitive, a lot of programs are case sensitive. Case does have a purpose. In Windows, you can save things with a capital letter or not, and it doesn't matter. Over here, however, if you use a capital letter, if you then try to access it without the capital letter, it isn't going to work. So to make things easier for you, we're going to turn the editor off so it's not in capital letter searches. It's gonna, it doesn't matter what you search for. So we're going to do a colon, uh, and then we're going to do set IC, which is just going to turn off case sensitivity, basically. Then we're going to use a forward slash, which is the search option, and then I want to search for the United Kingdom. Okay, so as you can see where the cursor is there, that's the first one it's come across. So I'm going to move with the arrow down one onto the line, and now I'm going to copy and paste it at the top of the file. To do copying in VI, it's called yanking, uh, which I believe is more of an American phrase, and we're going to use it to yank it out, and then we're going to push it in. So press Y, Y, that'll yank it, then number one for line one and a capital G for go. That takes us back to the top of the file. Then with the arrow, just take yourself down into the open space there and press P for paste. And you'll see it's pasted my line. As you probably noticed there, if you get good with this, if you knew what, what line number the top line was, you could have gone straight to that line rather than going to line one and then just pasted your line. That's the power of VI that once you get used to using it, you can navigate wherever you want. Now that we've done that, we want to save the file. So press escape to make sure you've come out of insert mode. Do the colon again and X for save and exit and then press enter. And that file is now saved and ready to go. So I'm now gonna just clear the screen, which is another handy thing you may find you wanna do uh, with control and L so that we can see what we're doing here. And now comes the exciting bit. We're going to install the Arch Linux file system. A pointer here, don't panic if the disk that you downloaded for the ISO which we're running right now was back in November when I started the videos or whatever. It's not too much of a deal. I mean, you can go and download it again. But the great thing about Arch is it's always cutting edge, if you like. It's always up to date. So when we install it now, it's not going to fetch some old version of the files. It's quite literally going to go and get the current files and packages and install it to the current standards. So they give us a nice, simple program. Now that's another thing I'll mention here. This is all about having a bit of fun and learning Linux, but Arch is a little bit misunderstood I think. Um, yes it is a command line, no it hasn't got graphical things, but they do, they focus really heavily on the simplicity and the easiness of its use. Because at the end of the day, even if it's on the command line and we're typing things, we don't want to have to type lots of things. And they've thought of all these things. So like, they have a nice little tool called Packstrap. It's one command. We write Packstrap, we tell it which folder is going to be our root folder, where we've got our drive mounted, which is mount. And then we tell it we want to install the base installation of Linux, which is the foundation, the basic stuff that you need to just get it working. And that's it. You press enter. It's now going and checking the mirrors. And now it's downloading the files. This is live. It's happening straight off the current mirrors. It's all the latest uh, packages and installs that you would get. While it's doing that, I'll talk a little bit about what we're going to do next. So we're going to copy all these files down, and this is going to create what we call the Linux file system. It's all the programs and the tools, the kernel itself, which is the bit that loads up and makes all the magic happen. Um, and I'm trying to think what else might be in there. There's all sorts of things anyway, all the basic packages you have in Linux. What we have to do next is we have to generate what we call an FS tab file. Now, if you come across here, and remember I did mention this in the previous video, do refer to the Arch Linux installation guide because it is a cutting edge system and they change things all the time. So even since November, some things have changed since I started making the videos. Not so much in this section, but certainly later on there are new developments which make things a lot better. So you can see we've done that bit there and we're now coming to the configure the system section where we now need to create an FS tab file. 
FSTAB file is basically a file system table and it tells Linux what file systems we want it to mount when we boot it up. Otherwise it hasn't got a clue what we want to do. So what we want to do is tell it we want to boot up and we want our root file system to be there, we want our swap drive to be there and we want our boot sector to be there. Now the boot sector will kind of be there anyway because it will have been grabbed earlier on in the process but you still have to tell it that it's supposed to be there or it will get upset. And the great thing is they've given us a tool called generate FS tab, gen FS tab will generate file system tab, right? Gen FS tab, there you go, I'll use the tab key to auto complete it. Now we're going to use minus U, which means use UUIDs. They're unique ID numbers. And the idea of that is, is with drives, as you move them around in a machine, sometimes they get different names because the naming system works in a way that if you move a drive, it might be called SDA. If you move it around in the system, it could become SDC. Obviously, if you hard code and write into a file that you want to mount a drive on SDA and it moves to SDB, you're not going to boot, and that's bad times. The beautiful thing about the unique ID system, no matter where you put it, it will always have the same unique ID. So I recommend you don't do it the old and easy way. Just use UUIDs. There are plenty of tools to get them or set them. Don't be frightened of them. They're the way forward. So minus U will give us UUIDs. We tell it that mount is going to be our root file system, so it knows to go and look there and see what we've got based on that structure. And then we're going to tell it we want it to create the file in mount, because that's where we've put our root file system, oopsie daisy with the typo. Then etc. And then FS tab. Okay, That's going to generate the file system table and stick it in the file MNT etc. FS tab. There you go, it's done it. Now we're going to do what's called shooting. Now shooting basically changes root. That's what it stands for, change root. So a little bit of a cap here. When we started the CD and it booted the Arch Linux live CD, what it did is it loaded the Arch Linux kernel into the memory of your computer. It then mounted uh, an initial or an initialization RAM file system in there, which had a few things in there, and it created what you see now. Everything you're doing at the moment is all in the memory. Now, at the moment, it's using the root file system that it provides in the memory, okay? What we want to do now is we want to tell it that we want it to start using our new file system as its root file system, so that then it's almost like it being the actual system booted. Everything we do inside of our root file system is done as if we'd mounted it in the beginning. That may not make too much sense to some people. Try not to worry about it too much. Keep it light and hearted and everything. But just trust me on this one that that's what it does. Now... A little thing to again pimp Arch and its simpleness to actually do uh, to actually change a root by hand is about five or six different commands usually to make it work. That's complicated. You've got to remember what different file systems you're supposed to be mounting, like the dev file system and the sys file system. These are all parts of the Arch Linux kernel, which, if you're not familiar with it, becomes incredibly confusing. Again, Arch have took care of that. And they've just given you a nice easy command called archroot, which is basically just going to do all that for you. You just tell it which root file system you want to actually make your root file system. And guess what? Boom, it does it. We're in. Now, if I type this, which is list all things in a human readable format, that now that you can see there is your new system that you've installed. They're the files you just downloaded with Packstrap. And they're the files that are going to be the base of your Linux, Arch Linux system. Back to the installation guide, double check what we're doing here. First thing we need to do is we need to change the time zone. Obviously, depending on where you are in the world, you've got your own time zone, so you're gonna to wanna to set it. The default time zone, I believe, is UTC. Let's check it, shall we? There's a nice basic command called date. You just type date in there and press enter. It will show you the current time zone. In this case, UTC, so universal time, which is just the default, if you like. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna tell it what country we're in. Now, the way we do that is we create a thing called a symlink. LN stands for link, minus S stands for symlink, which is a bit like a desktop shortcut, if you like, and F is force. We want to force it because there's probably something already there, and if we don't force it, it's going to say, I'm sorry, there's something already there. We don't care about what's already there. We want to replace it with what we want. Then we go to user, share, zone info, then you choose your area. In my case, I'm in Europe, and then London, because that's the capital city of my particular country. You choose the one for yours. If it's in the States, you choose the Americas, and then your state. If you're in Germany, Europe, Germany, etc. 
Once you've chosen that, you then want to link it to a file called etc. local time. I say that with no, that's correct. Yeah, all the confidence was slipping there. So etc. local time um, and press enter. And now, if you do the date command again, you can see now that mine's changed to BST or British Summer Time. So you're set. Your time zone is set, and it, it's good. The next thing we need to do is we need to make sure that the hardware clock is synchronized with the Linux clock. Without going into too much detail, your computer has a clock built into the motherboard, if you like. Uh, it runs off the battery that's on there. It's what we call the hardware clock. Uh, you can set it when you go in the BIOS. Uh, and then you have the time that's managed on the computer. The two of them can drift, basically, and you want to make sure that they drift together nicely. So they have a little command here called HW clock. That stands for hardware clock. And we're basically saying system time to hardware clock. That now will do a little bit of math, and it's put a file away somewhere safe, which gives it a mathematical equation. Well, it's actually a mathematical number, which is the drift factor, which it can then calculate the correct time. Not going to go into detail about that, but it just means that your time will stay nice and steady. The next important thing we need to do is set up our locale, and that's basically where you live. So in my case, I'm in the UK. My language set on a computer is English, Great British. And the character set we all use these days is UTF-8. So yours will be something similar. Um, by default, it's set to the US uh, format, English US. So you don't, if you're in the US, you don't need to change anything. For me, I don't need to change too much either. I am going to set the British character set, but my keyboard, which is the next set there, is an American keyboard because I'm using a MacBook Pro. And the MacBooks all have American layout keyboards. So don't get confused. If you've got a Mac and you're in another country, it's actually a US layout, so don't change anything. But of course, if you're on a PC and you're using a standard English keyboard, for example, you'd choose English. Or if it's a German keyboard, you'd choose German. So what we're going to do here is we're going to, first of all, edit a file called localgen. If I can remember what it's called. No, I can't remember what it's called. So, and again, this is why I'm using the guide because I don't do this every day. It's, it is called local.gen. That was close. Find local.gen. Um, I don't know if I'm being silly here. Um, Etc. local.gen. Local. Oh, there you go. Spelling also helps. Um, typos are a thing. I'm sorry about that. So, we go to this file, and this file basically has all of the locales that we can generate. You want to try and find yours, it's full of them. You can use the searching. I'm going to use the searching. If you remember again, it does case sensitive searches, so I'm just going to turn that off with set IC. And then I'm going to search for English Great British, right? ENGB. Here we go, look. ENGB UTF 8. That's the one I want. As you can see there, just to give you examples, you've got English Australia, AU, uh, English Israel. So, you know, find out what your country code is. If you're not sure, don't panic, just Google it. Some, you know, it will be on Google, you'll be able to find it. So I'm going to tell it that I want to create the English Great British locale. Hit escape, hit colon, X to save and exit. And then I'm going to run the program locale gen, which is what I jumped ahead too far earlier on. And I don't spell locale properly, apparently, which is a problem. Press that, and as you can see, it's now generating the locale. And that's now generated, basically, all the characters in your in your language, if you like. Now we've done that, again, I mentioned it before, but check that you've your keyboard set correctly, because if you don't set it in this file, the vconsole file, you won't have the right key map when you boot up, and then you're going to have keys missing, and you don't want that. The example on their website is for a German Latin keyboard, for example. I don't need to set it, as I said before, because I'm on a Mac and it's a US keyboard, which is the default keyboard layout. Now the next thing we need to do is set what we call a host name. Because Linux tends to be a system that does exist on the internet, we have names for servers, or in any network indeed, you can actually use names as an easy way to identify a computer. So we're going to use VI again, etc. host name. Now it doesn't matter what you call it, to be honest, so I'm going to call this my arch because it's my arch installation. Escape, call on escape and exit. So my machine is now called my arch. The next thing we do is we edit something called the host file. And this basically is how the computer figures out where things are. Um, 127001 is basically the IP address for the local machine. It's, it's basically its own address. 
so it can talk to itself, if that makes sense. If you have a program that runs on the, on the computer, on Linux in this case, and it needs to talk to itself, it can do so by its name. And that's why we have to stick the name in here. So I've called my MyArch in the host name file. So you're going to put whatever you've called your first bit in here, dot local domain, tab it, and then just the name, so MyArch. This basically tells it that if it's called MyArch, then it knows that that means it's got to connect to itself if it wants to address itself. I don't want to go too deep into it at this point, keeping it light, but things like email servers and things like that do need to know how to find themselves because they'll get very upset if they don't know where they are. So when you've put your stuff in there, again, escape, colon, x for exit, that's that saved. We're nearly there, we're nearly there, people. The next step is the network. Don't panic, I know networking is a frightening thing. I'm not a network engineer either, just for the record. But we're just gonna keep it real simple. And here's an example of something that has changed since the November when I did the first videos. So just a little cap here, with the networks, you get what we call network managers, and a lot of Linux distributions come with their own favorites. Um, if you use the GNOME desktop, you'll probably find that you're gonna to need to use a thing called, um, I think it's called Network Manager off the top of my head, and that's their preferred manager. We're gonna use the built-in Arch one for now, uh, and that's called NetCTL. Now, in the old way, you used to say, create a, what we call a NetCTL profile. So you create a profile, which is the name of your connection and what you want that to be. In this case, we want it to be what's called DHCP. It's basically a system where it goes off and it asks the router for an IP address. You probably have that in your own homes. You just connect the computer up, but it finds automatically connects. You don't have to put any addresses in or anything like that. Now, the only downside to that is that if we create that at the start and it then tries to run it, it can hold the boot up while it's trying to bring the interface up and do all this kind of thing. And it makes the boot process really slow. Uh, quite literally, you will start booting and then you'll have to wait a minute while it sorts it all out. One of the good things is we've got a thing now that we call System D. And System D is basically the system which brings up all the initial systems when the system boots. It brings up things such as any services you've got. It brings you into the desktop or it brings you into your, your what we call a run level, the level of the system that you log into. Uh, it looks after services, it looks after drivers, it looks after all sorts of things. Anything that's that's got to load up and be ran or be monitored or anything like if you plug a USB device in and it needs to suddenly do something because the USB device was plugged in, it'll be System D that takes care of it. I'm not going to go into lots of detail about System D. I will do a separate video about System D just to talk to you about what System D is, um, why some people don't like it, why it's the future and also a bit about System 5, which was the old system that we've been using in Linux for a long time. But basically all these things do, when you switch on the computer, the system comes on, it goes to the start of the hard disk, it finds what we call the boot sector, it reads it and runs your boot loader. In this case, we're gonna be using Grub and you'll see us install it in a minute. That then gives you a menu which will have your Linux kernel in it. When you run the Linux kernel, that loads from the boot partition, the kernel, that goes into your memory and then it's got an initial RAM file system that also goes into memory. It then sets itself up, sets all the computer up. It then mounts the root file system, and that's when we hands the control over to system D, which then loads all the other things for you. Or if you're using an older system, that would have been system 5's init system, um, or system 5 init, as we called it, where it would load things in, an, in a very specific order, not in a parallel way. with with. System D it loads things a lot faster because it can load more than one thing at once. I think that covers it pretty pretty concisely without going too far off what we're doing. So what we're going to do here is we're going to install the network. Now because this is quite a daunting thing, I'm going to stop the video here and we're going to start the next video from the network onwards because I think that one's going to be a big one for people to want to do. So hope you've enjoyed it. Hope it's made a lot of sense. Again, sorry it's took me so long to put this together. I'm going to go off now and do the second video. <laughs> I'm trying to get them all released for you in one go because you've been so patient. And then hopefully you'll enjoy them, you'll have a bit of fun with it, and off you go. So I'll see you next time. Goodbye.